Introduction to the Saga of Eric the Red. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The Saga of Eric the Red. Translated by Arthur Middleton Reeves. Introduction the clearest and most complete narrative of the discovery of wineland preserved in the ancient icelandic literature is that presented in the saga of eric the red of this narrative two complete vellum texts have survived the eldest of these texts is contained in the arna magnaean codex number five forty four which is commonly known as hauk's book this manuscript has derived its name from its first owner for whom the work was doubtless written and who himself participated in the labor of its preparation this man to whom the manuscript traces its origin has happily left not only in the manuscript itself but in the history of his time a record which enables us to determine with exceptional accuracy many dates in his life and from these it is possible to assign approximate dates to that portion of the vellum which contains the narrative of the discovery this fact possesses the greater interest since of no one of those who participated in the conservation of the elder sagas have we data so precise as those which have been preserved to us of hauk erlinson to whose care actual and potential this manuscript owes its existence we know that jorun the mother of this man was the direct descendant of a famous icelander his paternal ancestry is not so clearly established it has been conjectured that his father erlend olafsson surnamed the stout was the son of a man of humble parentage and by birth a norwegian this view has been discredited however and the fact pretty clearly established that erlend's father olaf was no other than a certain icelander called olaf tot hauk's father erlend was probably the elinder bondi of a letter addressed by certain Icelanders to the Norwegian king, Magnus Law Amender, in the year 1275. In the year 1283, we find indubitable mention of him in Icelandic annals as Legifer, he having in that year come out to Iceland from Norway, vested with the dignity of lawman. It is as the incumbent of a similar office to which he appears to have been appointed in 1294, that we first find Hauk Erlendsen mentioned. It is not unlikely that Hauk had visited Norway prior to 1301. There can be no doubt that he was in that country in the latter part of that year, for he was a lawman in Oslo, the modern Christiania, upon the 28th of January, 1302, since upon that date he published an autographic letter which is still in existence. Whether the rank of knighthood, which carried with it the title of Hera, or Earl, had already been conferred upon him at this time is not certain. He is first mentioned with this title in Icelandic annals in 1306, elsewhere in 1305, although it has been claimed that he had probably then enjoyed this distinction for some years, but upon what authority is not clear. While Hauk revisited Iceland upon more than one occasion, after the year 1302, much of the remainder of his life appears to have been spent in Norway, where he died in the year 1334. On the back of page 21 of Hauk's book, Arne Magnusson has written, probably with a view to preserve a fading entry upon the same page, the words, This book belongs to Tate Paulsen, if he be not robbed. It is not known who this Tate Paulsen was but it is recorded that a man of this name sailed from Iceland to Norway in the year 1344. He may have been the one-time owner of the book, and, if the manuscript was then in Norway, may have carried it back to Iceland with him. Apart from this conjecture, the fact remains that the early history of Hauk's book is shrouded in obscurity. It is first mentioned in the beginning of the 17th century by John the Learned, possibly about 1600, and a few years later by Arngrim Jonsson. It was subsequently loaned to Bishop Brynjolf Svensson, 
who caused the transcripts of the lan nama book and the Krishni saga to be made from it as has already been related this part of the codex the bishop may have returned to the owner himself retaining the remainder for with the exception of the two sagas named arni magnusson obtained the codex from gualveriaber in the south of iceland and subsequently the remaining leaves of the missing sagas from the rev olaf jonsson who was the clergyman at stadt in grunavik in northwestern iceland between the years seventeen o three and seventeen o seven hauk's book originally contained about two hundred leaves with widely varied contents certain leaves of the original manuscript have been detached from the main body of the book and are now to be found in the Arna Magnaean collection. A portion has been lost, but 107 leaves of the original codex are preserved. With the exception of those portions just referred to, that part of the manuscript which treats of the Wineland discovery is to be found in this last-mentioned volume, from leaves 93 to 101, inclusive. The saga therein contained has no title contemporary with the text, but Argni Magnusson has inserted in the space left vacant for the title the words, Here begins the saga of Torfin Karsefni and Snorri Torbranson, although it is not apparent whether he himself invented this title or derived it from some now unknown source. The saga of Torfin Karsefni was written by three different persons. The first portion is in a hand commonly ascribed to Hauk's so-called first Icelandic secretary. On page 99, line 14, the ink and the hand change, and beginning with the words Eiríkar Svalrarvel, the chirography is Hauk's own, as is readily apparent from a comparison with the autographic letter of 1302, already referred to. Hauk's own work continues throughout this and the following page, ceasing at the end of the second line on page 100 with the words koludu i hopi where he gives place to a new scribe his so-called second icelandic secretary page 101 and himself concludes the saga two of the leaves upon which the saga is written are of an irregular shape and there are holes in two other leaves these defects were however present in the vellum from the beginning so that they in no wise affect the integrity of the text. On the other hand, the lower right-hand corner of page 99 has become badly blackened, and is, in consequence, partially illegible, as is also the left-hand corner of page 101. Similarly, pages 100 and 101 back are somewhat indistinct, but in the original still not undecipherable. Initial letters are inserted in red and blue, and the subtitles in red ink, which has sadly faded. There are three paginations, of which the latest in red is the one here adopted. The genealogy appended to the saga has been brought down to Hauk's own time, and Hauk therein traces his ancestry to Karlsefni's Wineland-born son. By means of this genealogical list, we are enabled to determine approximately the date of this transcript of the original saga, for we read in this list of Halbera, abbess of Raininess, and since we know that Halbera was not consecrated abbess until the year 1299, it becomes at once apparent that the saga could not have been completed before that year. This conclusion is corroborated by additional evidence furnished by this ancestral list, for in this list Hauk has given himself his title Hera, or Earl. As has been stated, Hauk is first accorded this title in 1305, he is last mentioned without the title in 1304, which fact not only confirms the conclusion already reached, but enables us to advance the date prior to which the transcript of the saga could not have been concluded to 1304. It is not so easy to determine positively when the saga was finished. As Hauk's own hand brings the saga to a conclusion, it is evident that it must have been completed before or not later than the year 1334, the year of his death. If we accept the words of the genealogical list literally, it would appear that Hauk wrote this list not many years before his death, 
for it is there stated that fru ingegerd's daughter was fru halbera the abbess but halbera lived until thirteen thirty and the strict construction of hauk's language might point to the conclusion that the reference to halbera was made after her death and therefore after thirteen thirty hauk was in iceland in the years thirteen thirty and thirteen thirty one doubtless for the last time one of the scribes who aided him in writing the codex was probably an icelander as may be gleaned from his orthography and as it is highly probable that the contents of the codex were for the most part copied from originals owned in iceland it may be that the transcript of this saga as well as the book itself was completed during this last visit it has been claimed that a portion of hauk's book preceding the saga of torfinn was written prior to hauk's acquirement of his title a view founded upon the fact that his name is there cited without the addition of his title and this view is supported by the corresponding usage of the annals if this be true then upon the above hypothesis a period of more than twenty-five years must have elapsed between the inception of the work and the completion of the torfinn saga doubtless a considerable time was consumed in the compilation and transcription of the contents of this manuscript but it seems scarcely probable that so long a time should have intervened between the preparation of the different portions of the work wherefore if the reference to the abbess halbera be accepted literally the conjecture that the earlier portion of the codex was written prior to twelve ninety nine would appear to be doubtful and it may be necessary either to advance the date of this portion of the manuscript or place the date of the saga of torfinn anterior to that suggested however this may be two facts seem to be clearly established first that this saga was not written before twelve ninety nine and second that this eldest surviving detailed narrative of the discovery of wineland was written not later than the year thirteen thirty four in the vellum codex known as number five fifty seven of the arnamagnaean collection is an account of the wineland discovery so strikingly similar to that of hauk's book that there can be no doubt that both histories were derived from the same source the history of the discovery contained in the above codex is called the saga of eric the red this may well have been the primitive title of the saga of hauk's book which as has been noted obtains its modern name torfinn saga calfesnis from the entry made by argni magnusson early in the eighteenth century that both sagas were copied from the same vellum is by no means certain if both transcripts be judged strictly by their contents it becomes at once apparent that this could not have been the fact and such a conjecture is only tenable upon the theory that the scribes of hauk's book edited the saga which they copied this while it is very doubtful in the case of the body of the text of the hauk's book saga of torfinn may not even be conjectured of the saga of eric the red the latter saga was undoubtedly a literal copy from the original for there are certain minor confusions of the text which indicate unmistakably either the heedlessness of the copyist or that the scribe was working from a somewhat illegible original whose defects he was not at pains to supply if both sagas were copied from different early vellums the simpler language of the saga of eric the red would seem to indicate that it was a transcript of a somewhat earlier form of the saga than that from which the saga of hauk's book was derived this however is entirely conjectural for the codex containing the saga of eric the red was not written for many years after hauk's book and probably not until the following century so much the orthography and hand of five fifty seven indicate and from the application of this test the codex has been determined to date from the fifteenth century and has been ascribed by very eminent authority to circa fourteen hundred the saga of eric the red begins with the thirteenth line of page twenty seven of the codex the title appears at the top of this page and concludes in the fifth line on the back of page thirty five the hand being the same throughout spaces were left for initial letters but these were not inserted except in one case by a different and indifferent penman 
with the exception of a very few words or portions of words upon page thirty and page thirty one the manuscript of the saga is clearly legible throughout certain slight defects in the vellum have existed from the beginning and there is therefore no material hiatus in the entire text for the sense of the few indistinct words is either clearly apparent from the context or may be supplied from the sister text of hauck's book in his catalogue of parchment manuscripts arne magnusson states that he obtained this manuscript from bishop john vidalin and adds the conjecture that it had either belonged to the skaholt church or came thither from among bishop brynjolf's books this conjecture that the book belonged to the church of skaholt has however been disputed and the place of its compilation at the same time assigned to the north of iceland the saga of eric the red and both texts are included under this title presents a clear and graphic account of the discovery and exploration of wineland the good in this narrative the discovery is ascribed to leif the son of eric the red who hit upon the land by chance during a voyage from norway to greenland this voyage as has already been stated probably took place in the year one thousand after his return to greenland leif's account of the land which he had discovered seems to have persuaded his brother thorstein and possibly his father to undertake an expedition to the strange country this voyage which was not destined to meet with a successful issue may well have fallen in the year following leif's return and therefore it may be conjectured in the year one thousand one about this time there had arrived in greenland an icelander of considerable prominence an old friend of eric's named torbjorn vifilsen who had brought with him his daughter gudrid or as she is also called turid he must have arrived before thorstein ericsson's voyage for we are told that it was in torbjorn's ship that this voyage was undertaken it seems probable that Torbjorn arrived at Brattahild, Eric's home, during Leif's absence from Greenland, and if this be true, it follows that Torbjorn and Gudrid must have been converted to Christianity before its acceptance in Iceland as the legalized religion of the land. For very soon after their arrival in Greenland, Gudrid alludes to the fact of her being a Christian, and, from the language of the saga, there can be no question that her father had likewise embraced the new faith the presence of these companions in the faith may have materially aided leif in the work of proselytism in which he engaged upon his return to greenland we are told that torbjorn did not arrive at brattahild until the second year after his departure from iceland wherefore if the assumption that he arrived during leif's absence be sound it becomes apparent that he must have left iceland in the summer of the year nine ninety eight or nine ninety nine eric's son thorstein wooed and married gudrid and the wedding was celebrated at brattahild in the autumn it is recorded in the saga that gudrid was regarded as a most desirable match thorstein may have promptly recognized her worth and his marriage may have occurred in the autumn of the same year in which he returned from his unlucky voyage it could not well have been celebrated in the previous year for thorstein's allusions on his deathbed to the religion of greenland indicate that christianity must have been for a longer time the accepted faith of the land than it could have been at the close of the year one thousand in the winter after his marriage thorstein died and in the spring gudrid returned to brattahild Torfinn Karlsefni arrived at Brattahild about this time, possibly the next autumn after Thorstein's death, and in his company came Snorri Torbranson. Karlsefni was married to Gudrid shortly after the Yuletide following his arrival. If he arrived in Greenland in the autumn of the year 1002, this wedding may accordingly have taken place about the beginning of the year 1003. In the summer following his marriage, Torfinn appears to have undertaken his voyage of exploration to Wineland, that is to say, in the summer of the year 1003. A longer time may well have elapsed after Gudrid's arrival before her marriage with Thorstein, and similarly it is even more probable that a longer interval elapsed 
between Torstein's death and Gudrid's second marriage. The purpose of this conjectural chronology is to determine, if possible, a date prior to which Torfinn Karlsefni's voyage to Wineland could not have been undertaken. While therefore it is altogether probable that this voyage was made after the year 1003, it does not appear to be possible, for the reasons presented, that it could have taken place before that year. Problems suggested by the text of another version of the history of the discovery and exploration, namely that contained in the Flady book, are considered elsewhere, as are also points of difference between that narrative and the history as set forth in the saga of Eric the Red. It remains to be said that the text of this saga does not present such difficulties as those which are suggested by a critical examination of the narrative of the Flady book. This version of the history of the discovery does contain, however, one statement which is not altogether intelligible, and which is not susceptible of very satisfactory explanation, namely, that there came no snow in the land which the Wineland explorers had found. This assertion does not agree with our present knowledge of the winter climate of the eastern coast of that portion of North America, situated within the latitude which was probably reached by the explorers. The observation may perhaps be best explained upon the theory that the original verbal statement of the explorers was that there was no snow in Wineland, such as that to which they were accustomed in the countries with which they were more familiar. With this single exception, there appears to be no statement in the saga of Eric the Red which is not lucid, and which is not reasonably consistent with our present knowledge of the probable regions visited. The incident of the adventure with the Uniped may be passed without especial mention in this connection. It gives evidence of the prevalent superstition of the time, it is true, but it in no way reflects upon the keenness of observation or relative credibility of the explorers. It follows, therefore, that the accounts of the discovery contained in Hauk's book and A.M. 557, whether they present the eldest form of the narrative of the Wineland explorers or not, do afford the most graphic and succinct exposition of the discovery, and, supported as they are throughout by contemporaneous history, appear in every respect most worthy of credence. End of introduction. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 1 of the Saga of Eric the Red Translated by Arthur Middleton Reeves This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 1 the Saga of Eric the Red, also called the Saga of Torfin Karlsefni and Snorri Torbranson. Olaf was the name of a warrior king, who was called Olaf the White. He was the son of King Ingjald, Helgi's son, the son of Olaf, Gudraud's son, son of Hafdan Whiteleg, king of the Uplands men. Olaf engaged in a western freebooting expedition, and captured Dublin in Ireland and the Shire of Dublin, over which he became king. He married Aud the Wealthy, daughter of Ketil Flatnose, son of Bjorn Buna, a famous man of Norway. Their son was called Torstein the Red. Olaf was killed in battle in Ireland, and Aud and Torstein went then to the Hebrides. There Torstein married Turid, daughter of Eivind Easterling, sister of Helgi the Lean. They had many children. Torstein became a warrior king and entered into fellowship with Earl Sigurd the Mighty, son of Eystein the Rattler. They conquered Caithness and Sutherland, Ross and Moray, and more than the half of Scotland. Over these, Torstein became king ere he was betrayed by the Scots and was slain there in battle. Aud was at Caithness when she heard of Torstein's death. She thereupon caused a ship to be secretly built in the forest, and when she was ready, she sailed out to the Orkneys. There she bestowed Groa, Torstein the Red's daughter, in marriage. She was the mother of Greylad, whom Earl Torfinn, Skull Cleaver, married. After this, Aud set out to seek Iceland, and had on board her ship twenty freemen. Aud arrived in Iceland, 
and passed the first winter at bjornarhofen with her brother bjorn and afterwards took possession of all the dale country between dogurdar river and skraumulaups river she lived at Vam and held her orisons at Crosshalar, where she caused crosses to be erected for she had been baptized and was a devout believer with her there came out to iceland many distinguished men who had been captured in the western freebooting expedition and were called slaves vifil was the name of one of these he was a high-born man who had been taken captive in the western sea and was called a slave before aud freed him now when aud gave homesteads to the members of her crew vifil asked wherefore she gave him no homestead as to the other men aud replied that this should make no difference to him saying that he would be regarded as a distinguished man wherever he was she gave him vifilsdal and there he dwelt he married a woman whose name was blank their sons were torbjorn and torgeir they were men of promise and grew up with their father eric the red finds greenland there was a man named torvald he was the son of asvald ulf's son eiksnatori's son his son's name was eric he and his father went from jaederen to iceland on account of manslaughter and settled on hornstrandir and dwelt at drangar there torvald died and eric then married torhild a daughter of jorund atli's son and torbjorg the ship chested who had been married before to torbjorn of the haukadal family eric then removed from the north and cleared land in haukadal and dwelt at ericstadir by vattenshorn then eric's thralls caused a landslide on valtiof's farm valtiof stadir eilf the fowl valtiof's kinsman slew the thralls near skadesbrekker above vattenshorn for this eric killed eilf the fowl and he also killed dueling hrafen at lakes kalar gerstein and od of jorva eilf's kinsmen conducted the prosecution for the slaying of their kinsmen and eric was in consequence banished from haukadal he then took possession of broki and eixni and dwelt at tradir on sudri the first winter it was at this time that he loaned torgest his outer dais boards eric afterwards went to eixni and dwelt at erikstad he then demanded his outer dais boards but did not obtain them eric then carried the outer dais boards away from breida bolstadt and torgest gave chase they came to blows a short distance from the farm of drangar there two of torgest's sons were killed and certain other men besides after this each of them retained a considerable body of men with him at his home Stier gave eric his support as did also eyolf of svini torbjorn vifil's son and the sons of torbrand of alptafirth while torgest was backed by the sons of tord the yeller and torger of hitardal aslak of langadal and his son ilugi eric and his people were condemned to outlawry at torsnes thing he equipped his ship for a voyage in eriksvag while eyolf concealed him in dimunnarvag when torgest and his people were searching for him among the islands he said to them that it was his intention to go in search of that land which gunnbjorn son of ulf the crow saw when he was driven out of his course westward across the main and discovered gunnbjorn's skerries he told them that he would return again to his friends if he should succeed in finding that country torbjorn and eyolf and Stier accompanied eric out beyond the islands and they parted with the greatest friendliness eric said to them that he would render them similar aid so far as it might lie within his power if they should ever stand in need of his help eric sailed out to sea from snaefell's yoko and arrived at that ice mountain which is called black sark thence he sailed to the southward that he might ascertain whether there was habitable country in that direction he passed the first winter at erixi near the middle of the western settlement in the following spring he proceeded to Eriksfirth and selected a site there for his homestead that summer he explored the western uninhabited region 
remaining there for a long time and assigning many local names there the second winter he spent at eric's homes beyond Varsnipa, but the third summer he sailed northward to snaefell and into hransfirth he believed then that he had reached the head of ericsfirth he turned back then and remained the third winter at Ericsi at the mouth of ericsfirth the following summer he sailed to iceland and landed in breidafirth he remained that winter with ingolf at home Later. in the spring he and Torgest fought together and eric was defeated after this a reconciliation was effected between them that summer eric set out to colonize the land which he had discovered and which he called greenland because he said men would be the more readily persuaded thither if the land had a good name concerning torbjorn torger vifil's son married and took to wife arnora daughter of einar of laugarbrekka sigmund's son son of ketil fistil who settled fistil's firth einar had another daughter named halveg she was married to torbjorn vifil's son who got with her laugarbrekka land on hellas velir torbjorn moved thither and became a very distinguished man he was an excellent husbandman and had a great estate gudrid was the name of torbjorn's daughter she was the most beautiful of her sex and in every respect a very superior woman there dwelt at arnarstapi a man named orm whose wife's name was haldis orm was a good husbandman and a great friend of torbjorn and gudrid lived with him for a long time as a foster daughter there was a man named torger who lived at torger's fell he was very wealthy and had been manumitted he had a son named einar who was a handsome well-bred man and very showy in his dress einar was engaged in trading voyages from one country to the other and had prospered in this he always spent his winter alternating either in iceland or in norway now it is to be told that one autumn when einar was in iceland he went with his wares out along snaefell's nest with the intention of selling them he came to arnarstapi and orm invited him to remain with him and einar accepted this invitation for there was a strong friendship between orm and himself einar's wares were carried into a storehouse where he unpacked them and displayed them to orm and the men of his household and asked orm to take such of them as he liked orm accepted this offer and said that einar was a good merchant and was greatly favored by fortune now while they were busied about the wares a woman passed before the door of the storehouse einar inquired of orm who was that handsome woman who passed before the door i have never seen her here before orm replied that is gudrid my foster child the daughter of torbjorn of lagarbrekka she must be a good match said einar has she had any suitors orm replied in good sooth she has been courted friend nor is she easily to be won for it is believed that both she and her father will be very particular in their choice of a husband be that as it may quoth einar she is the woman to whom i mean to pay my addresses and i would have thee present this matter to her father in my behalf and use every exertion to bring it to a favorable issue and i shall reward thee to the full of my friendship if i am successful it may be that torbjorn will regard the connection as being to our mutual advantage for while he is a most honorable man and has a goodly home his personal effects i am told are somewhat on the wane but neither i nor my father are lacking in lands or chattels and torbjorn would be greatly aided thereby if this match should be brought about surely i believe myself to be thy friend replies orm and yet i am by no means disposed to act in this matter for torbjorn hath a very haughty spirit and is moreover a most ambitious man einar replied that he wished for naught else than that his suit should be broached orm replied that he should have his will einar fared again to the south until he reached his home some time after this torbjorn had an autumn feast as was his custom for he was a man of high position hither came orm of arnarstapi and many other of torbjorn's friends orm came to speech with torbjorn 
and said that einar of torgersfell had visited him not long before and that he was become a very promising man orm now makes known the proposal of marriage in einar's behalf and added that for some persons and for some reasons it might be regarded as a very appropriate match thou mayest greatly strengthen thyself thereby master by reason of the property torbiorn answers little did i expect to hear such words from thee that i should marry my daughter to the son of a thrall and that because it seems to thee that my means are diminishing wherefore she shall not remain longer with thee since thou deemest so mean a match as this suitable for her orm afterward returned to his home and all of the invited guests to their respective households while gudrid remained behind with her father and tarried at home that winter but in the spring torbjorn gave an entertainment to his friends to which many came and it was a noble feast and at the banquet torbjorn called for silence and spoke here have i passed a goodly lifetime and have experienced the good will of men towards me and their affection and methinks our relations together have been pleasant but now i begin to find myself in straitened circumstances although my estate has hitherto been accounted a respectable one now will i rather abandon my farming than lose my honour and rather leave the country than bring disgrace upon my family wherefore i have now concluded to put that promise to the test which my friend eric the red made when we parted company in Bridefirth. it is my present design to go to greenland this summer if matters fare as i wish the folk were greatly astonished at this plan of torbjorn's for he was blessed with many friends but they were convinced that he was so firmly fixed in his purpose that it would not avail to endeavour to dissuade him from it torbjorn bestowed gifts upon his guests after which the feast came to an end and the folk returned to their homes torbjorn sells his lands and buys a ship which was laid up at the mouth of Hraunhofen. thirty persons joined him in the voyage among these were orm of arnarstapi and his wife and other of torbjorn's friends who would not part from him then they put to sea when they sailed the weather was favourable but after they came out upon the high seas the fair wind failed and there came great gales and they lost their way and had a very tedious voyage that summer then illness appeared among their people and orm and his wife huldis died and the half of their company the sea began to run high and they had a very wearisome and wretched voyage in many ways but arrived nevertheless at herjolfsness in greenland on the very eve of winter at herjolfsness lived a man named torkel he was a man of ability and an excellent husbandman he received torbjorn and all his ship's company and entertained them well during the winter at that time there was a season of great dearth in greenland those who had been at the fisheries had had poor hauls, and some had not returned there was a certain woman there in the settlement whose name was torbjorg she was a prophetess and was called little sibyl she had had nine sisters all of whom were prophetesses but she was the only one left alive it was torbjorg's custom in the winters to go to entertainments and she was especially sought after at the homes of those who were curious to know their fate or what manner of season might be in store for them and inasmuch as torkel was the chief yeoman in the neighbourhood it was thought to devolve upon him to find out when the evil time which was upon them would cease torkel invited the prophetess to his home and careful preparations were made for her reception according to the custom which prevailed when women of her kind were to be entertained a high seat was prepared for her in which a cushion filled with poultry feathers was placed when she came in the evening with the man who had been sent to meet her she was clad in a dark blue cloak fastened with a strap and set with stones quite down to the hem she wore glass beads around her neck and upon her head a black lambskin hood lined with white catskin in her hand she carried a staff upon which there was a knob which was ornamented with brass and set with stones up about the knob circling her waist she wore a girdle of touchwood and attached to it a great skin pouch in which she kept the charms which she used when she was practising her sorcery 
she wore upon her feet shaggy calfskin shoes with long tough latchets upon the ends of which there were large brass buttons she had catskin gloves upon her hands which were white inside and lined with fur when she entered all of the folk felt it to be their duty to offer her becoming greetings she received the salutations of each individual according as he pleased her yeoman torkel took the sibyl by the hand and led her to the seat which had been made ready for her torkel bade her run her eyes over man and beast and home she had little to say concerning all these the tables were brought forth in the evening and it remains to be told what manner of food was prepared for the prophetess a porridge of goat's beastings was made for her and for meat there were dressed the hearts of every kind of beast which could be obtained there she had a brass spoon and a knife with a handle of walrus tusk with a double hasp of brass around the haft and from this the point was broken and when the tables were removed yeoman torkel approached torbjorg and asked how she was pleased with the home and the character of the folk and how speedily she would be likely to become aware of that concerning which he had questioned her and which the people were anxious to know she replied that she could not give an opinion in this matter before the morrow after that she had slept there through the night and on the morrow when the day was far spent such preparations were made as were necessary to enable her to accomplish her soothsaying she bade them bring her those women who knew the incantation which she required to work her spells and which she called warlocks but such women were not to be found thereupon a search was made throughout the house to see whether anyone knew this incantation then said gudrid although i am neither skilled in the black art nor a sibyl yet my foster-mother haldis taught me in iceland that spell-song which she called warlocks torbjorg answered then art thou wise in season gudrid replied this is an incantation and ceremony of such a kind that i do not mean to lend it any aid for that i am a christian woman torbjorg answered it might so be that thou couldst give thy help to the company here and still be no worse woman than before however i leave it with torkel to provide for my needs torkel now so urged gudrid that she said she must needs comply with his wishes the women then made a ring round about while torbjorg sat up on the spell dais gudrid then sang the song so sweet and well that no one remembered ever before to have heard the melody sung with so fair a voice as this the sorceress thanked her for the song and said she has indeed lured many spirits hither who think it pleasant to hear this song those who were wont to forsake us hitherto and refuse to submit themselves to us many things are now revealed to me which hitherto have been hidden both from me and from others and i am able to announce that this period of famine will not endure longer but the season will mend as spring approaches the visitation of disease which has been so long upon you will disappear sooner than expected and thee gudrid i shall reward out of hand for the assistance which thou hast vouchsafed us since the fate in store for thee is now all made manifest to me thou shalt make a most worthy match here in greenland but it shall not be of long duration for thee for thy future path leads out to iceland and a lineage both great and goodly shall spring from thee and above thy line brighter rays of light shall shine than i have power clearly to unfold and now farewell and health to thee my daughter after this the folk advanced to the sibyl and each besought information concerning that about which he was most serious she was very ready in her responses and little of that which she foretold failed of fulfilment after this they came for her from a neighboring farmstead and she thereupon set out thither torbjorn was then sent for since he had not been willing to remain at home while such heathen rites were practising the weather improved speedily when the spring opened even as torbjorg had prophesied torbjorn equipped his ship and sailed away until he arrived at brattahild eric received him with open arms and said that it was well that he had come thither torbjorn and his household remained with him during the winter while quarters were provided for the crew among the farmers in the following spring eric gave torbjorn land on stokanus 
where a goodly farmstead was founded and there he lived thenceforward end of part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two of the saga of eric the red translated by arthur middleton reeves this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two concerning leif the lucky and the introduction of christianity into greenland eric was married to a woman named torhild and had two sons one of these was named torstein and the other leif they were both promising men torstein lived at home with his father and there was not at that time a man in greenland who was accounted of so great promise as he leif had sailed to norway where he was at the court of king olaf Tryggvason. when leif sailed from greenland in the summer they were driven out of their course to the hebrides it was late before they got fair winds thence and they remained there far into the summer leif became enamoured of a certain woman whose name was torguna she was a woman of fine family and leif observed that she was possessed of rare intelligence when leif was preparing for his departure torguna asked to be permitted to accompany him leif inquired whether she had in this the approval of her kinsman she replied that she did not care for it leif responded that he did not deem it the part of wisdom to abduct so high-born a woman in a strange country and we so few in number it is by no means certain that thou shalt find this to be the better decision said torguna i shall put it to the proof notwithstanding said leif then i tell thee said torguna that i am no longer a lone woman for i am pregnant and upon thee i charge it i foresee that i shall give birth to a male child and though thou give this no heed yet will i rear the boy and send him to thee in greenland when he shall be fit to take his place with other men and i foresee that thou wilt get as much profit of this son as is thy due from this our parting moreover i mean to come to greenland myself before the end comes leif gave her a gold finger ring a greenland wadmal mantle and a belt of walrus tusk this boy came to greenland and was called torgils leif acknowledged his paternity and some men will have it that this torgils came to iceland in the summer before the frodo wonder however this torgils was afterwards in greenland and there seemed to be something not altogether natural about him before the end came leif and his companions sailed away from the hebrides and arrived in norway in the autumn leif went to the court of king olaf Tryggvason. he was well received by the king who felt that he could see that leif was a man of great accomplishments upon one occasion the king came to speech with leif and asked him is it thy purpose to sail to greenland in the summer it is my purpose said leif if it be your will i believe it will be well answers the king and thither thou shalt go upon my errand to proclaim christianity there leif replied that the king should decide but gave it as his belief that it would be difficult to carry this mission to a successful issue in greenland the king replied that he knew of no man who would be better fitted for this undertaking and in thy hands the cause will surely prosper this can only be said leif if i enjoy the grace of your protection leif put to sea when his ship was ready for the voyage for a long time he was tossed about upon the ocean and came upon lands of which he had previously had no knowledge there were self-sown wheat fields and vines growing there there were also those trees there which are called mausur and of all these they took specimens some of the timbers were so large that they were used in building leif found men upon a wreck and took them home with him and procured quarters for them all during the winter in this wise he showed his nobleness and goodness since he introduced christianity into the country and saved the men from the wreck and he was called leif the lucky ever after leif landed in ericsfirth and then went home to Brattahild. he was well received by everyone he soon proclaimed christianity throughout the land and the catholic faith and announced king olaf Tryggvason's messages to the people 
telling them how much excellence and how great glory accompanied this faith eric was slow in forming the determination to forsake his old belief but tjoldhild embraced the faith promptly and caused the church to be built at some distance from the house this building was called tjoldhild's church and there she and those persons who had accepted christianity and they were many were wont to offer their prayers Tjodhild would not have intercourse with Eric after that she had received the faith, whereat he was sorely vexed. At this time there began to be much talk about a voyage of exploration to that country which Leif had discovered. The leader of this expedition was Torstein Eriksson, who was a good man and an intelligent and blessed with many friends. Eric was likewise invited to join them, for the men believed that his luck and foresight would be of great furtherance. He was slow in deciding, but did not say nay, when his friends besought him to go. They thereupon equipped that ship in which Torbjorn had come out, and twenty men were selected for the expedition. They took little cargo with them, naught else save their weapons and provisions. On that morning, when Eric set out from his home, he took with him a little chest containing gold and silver. He hid this treasure and then went his way. He had proceeded but a short distance, however, when he fell from his horse and broke his ribs and dislocated his shoulder, whereat he cried, Ay, ay! By reason of this accident, he sent his wife word that she should procure the treasure which he had concealed, for to the hiding of the treasure he attributed his misfortune. Thereafter they sailed cheerily out of Eriksfirth in high spirits over their plan. They were long tossed about upon the ocean, and could not lay the course they wished. They came in sight of Iceland, and likewise saw birds from the Irish coast. Their ship was, in sooth, driven hither and thither over the sea. In the autumn they turned back, worn out by toil and exposure to the elements, and exhausted by their labors, and arrived at Eriksfirth at the very beginning of winter. Then, said Eric, more cheerful were we in the summer when we put out of the firth, but we still live, and it might have been much worse. Torstein answers, It will be a princely deed to endeavor to look well after the wants of all these men who are now in need, and to make provision for them during the winter. Eric answers, It is ever true, as it is said, that it is never clear ere the answer comes, and so it must be here. We will act now upon thy counsel in this manner. All of the men who were not otherwise provided for accompanied the father and son. They landed thereupon, and went home to Brattahild, where they remained throughout the winter. Torstein Eriksson weds Gudrid. Apparitions. Now it is to be told that Torstein Eriksson sought Gudrid, Torbjorn's daughter, in wedlock. His suit was favorably received both by herself and by her father, and it was decided that Torstein should marry Gudrid, and the wedding was held at Brattahild in the autumn. The entertainment sped well, and it was very numerously attended. Torstein had a home in the western settlement at a certain farmstead which is called Lisufirth. A half-interest in this property belonged to a man named Torstein, whose wife's name was Sigrid. Torstein went to Lisufirth in the autumn to his namesake, and Gudrid bore him company. They were well received, and remained there during the winter. It came to pass that sickness appeared in their home early in the winter. Guard was the name of the overseer there. He had few friends. He took sick first and died. It was not long before one after another took sick and died. Then Torstein, Eric's son, fell sick, and Sigrid, the wife of Torstein, his namesake. And one evening Sigrid wished to go to the house, which stood over against the outer door, and Gudrid accompanied her. They were facing the outer door when Sigrid uttered a loud cry. We have acted thoughtlessly, exclaimed Gudrid, yet thou needest not cry, though the cold strikes thee. Let us go in again as speedily as possible. Sigrid answered, This may not be in this present plight. All of the dead folk are drawn up here before the door now. Among them I see thy husband, Torstein, and I can see myself there, and it is distressful to look upon. But directly this had passed, she exclaimed, Let us go now, Gudrid, I no longer see the band. The overseer had vanished from her sight, 
whereas it had seemed to her before that he stood with a whip in his hand and made as if he would scourge the flock so they went in and ere the morning came she was dead and a coffin was made ready for the corpse and that same day the men planned to row out to fish and thorstein accompanied them to the landing place and in the twilight he went down to see their catch thorstein eric's son then sent word to his namesake that he should come to him saying that all was not as it should be there for the housewife was endeavouring to rise to her feet and wished to get in under the clothes beside him and when he entered the room she was come up on the edge of the bed he thereupon seized her hands and held a pole-axe before her breast thorstein eric's son died before nightfall thorstein the master of the house bade gudrid lie down in sleep saying that he would keep watch over the bodies during the night thus she did and early in the night thorstein eric's son sat up and spoke saying that he desired gudrid to be called thither for that it was his wish to speak with her it is god's will that this hour be given me for my own and for the betterment of my condition thorstein the master went in search of gudrid and waked her and bade her cross herself and pray god to help her thorstein eric's son has said to me that he wishes to see thee thou must take counsel with thyself now what thou wilt do for i have no advice to give thee she replied it may be that this is intended to be one of those incidents which shall afterward be held in remembrance this strange event and it is my trust that god will keep watch over me wherefore under god's mercy i shall venture to go to him and learn what it is that he would say for i may not escape this if it be designed to bring me harm i will do this lest he go further for it is my belief that the matter is a grave one so gudrid went and drew near to thorstein and he seemed to her to be weeping he spoke a few words in her ear in a low tone so that she alone could hear them but this he said so that all could hear that those persons would be blessed who kept well the faith and that it carried with it all help and consolation and yet many there were said he who kept it but ill this is no proper usage which has obtained here in greenland since christianity was introduced here to inter men in unconsecrated earth with naught but a brief funeral service it is my wish that i be conveyed to the church together with the others who have died here guard however i would have you burn upon a pyre as speedily as possible since he has been the cause of all of the apparitions which have been seen here during the winter he spoke to her also of her own destiny and said that she had a notable future in store for her but he bade her beware of marrying any greenlander he directed her also to give their property to the church and to the poor and then sank down again a second time it had been the custom in greenland after christianity was introduced there to bury persons on the farmsteads where they died in unconsecrated earth a pole was erected in the ground touching the breast of the dead and subsequently when the priest came thither the pole was withdrawn and holy water poured in the orifice and the funeral service held there although it might be long thereafter the bodies of the dead were conveyed to the church at ericsfirth and the funeral services held there by the clergy torbjorn died soon after this and all of his property then passed into gudrid's possession eric took her to his home and carefully looked after her affairs concerning tord of hofdi there was a man named tord who lived at hofdi on hofdi strands he married fridgerd daughter of tori the loiterer and fridgerd daughter of kjarval the king of the irish tord was a son of bjorn chestbutter son of torvald spine oslake's son the son of bjorn ironside the son of ragnar shaggy breeks they had a son named snorri he married torhild ptarmigan daughter of tord the yeller their son was tord horsehead torfin karlsefni was the name of tord's son torfin's mother's name was torun torfin was engaged in trading voyages and was reputed to be a successful merchant one summer karlsefni equipped his ship with the intention of sailing to greenland snorri torbrand's son of optafirth accompanied him and there were forty men on board the ship with them 
there was a man named biarni grimolf's son a man from Bredafirth, and another named Torhall, gamli's son an east firth man they equipped their ship the same summer as karlsefni with the intention of making a voyage to greenland they had also forty men in their ship when they were ready to sail the two ships put to sea together it has not been recorded how long a voyage they had but it is to be told that both of the ships arrived at ericsfirth in the autumn eric and other of the inhabitants of the country rowed to the ships and a goodly trade was soon established between them gudrid was requested by the skippers to take such of their wares as she wished while eric on his part showed great munificence in return in that he extended an invitation to both crews to accompany him home for winter quarters at Bratahild. The merchants accepted this invitation and went with Eric. Their wares were then conveyed to Bratahild, nor was there lack there of good and commodious storehouses in which to keep them, nor was there wanting much of that which they needed, and the merchants were well pleased with their entertainment at Eric's home during that winter. Now as it drew toward Yule, Eric became very taciturn, and less cheerful than had been his wont. On one occasion, Karlsefni entered into conversation with Eric and said, Hast thou aught weighing upon thee, Eric? The folk have remarked that thou art somewhat more silent than thou hast been hitherto. Thou hast entertained us with great liberality, and it behooves us to make such return as may lie within our power. Do thou now but make known the cause of thy melancholy. Eric answers, ye accept hospitality gracefully and in manly wise and i am not pleased that ye should be the sufferers by reason of our intercourse rather am i troubled at the thought that it should be given out elsewhere that ye have never passed a worse yule than this now drawing nigh when eric the red was your host at Brattahild in greenland there shall be no cause for that replied karlsefni we have malt and meal and corn in our ships and you are welcome to take of these whatsoever you wish, and to provide as liberal an entertainment as seems fitting to you. Eric accepted this offer, and preparations were made for the Yule feast, and it was so sumptuous that it seemed to the people that they had scarcely ever seen so grand an entertainment before. And after Yule, Karlsefni broached the subject of a marriage with Gudrid to Eric, for he assumed that with him rested the right to bestow her hand in marriage eric answered favorably and said that she would accomplish the fate in store for her adding that he had heard only good reports of him and not to prolong this the result was that torfin was betrothed to turid and the banquet was augmented and their wedding was celebrated and this befell at Brattahild during the winter end of part two Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3 of the Saga of Eric the Red, translated by Arthur Middleton Reeves. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3 Beginning of the Wineland Voyages about this time there began to be much talk at Brattahild to the effect that Wineland the Good should be explored, for, it was said, that country must be possessed of many goodly qualities. And so it came to pass that Karlsefni and Snorri fitted out their ship for the purpose of going in search of that country in the spring. Bjarni and Torhall joined the expedition with their ship and the men who had borne them company. There was a man named Torvard, he was wedded to Freydis, a natural daughter of Eric the Red. He also accompanied them together with Torvald, Eric's son, and Torhall, who was called the Huntsman. He had been for a long time with Eric as his hunter and fisherman during the summer, and as his steward during the winter. Torhall was stout and swarthy and of giant stature. He was a man of few words, though given to abusive language when he did speak, and he ever incited Eric to evil. He was a poor Christian. He had a wide knowledge of the unsettled regions. He was on the same ship with Torvard and Torvald. They had that ship which Torbjorn had brought out. They had in all one hundred and sixty men when they sailed to the western settlement and thence to Bear Island. Thence they bore away to the southward to Duger. 
then they saw land and launched a boat and explored the land and found their large flat stones and many of these were twelve ells wide there were many arctic foxes there they gave a name to the country and called it heluland the land of flat stones then they sailed with northerly winds to doger and land then lay before them and upon it was a great wood and many wild beasts an island lay off the land to the southeast and there they found a bear and they called this bjarni or bear island while the land where the wood was they called markland or forest land thence they sailed southward along the land for a long time and came to a cape the land lay upon the starboard there were long strands and sandy banks there they rode to the land and found upon the cape there the keel of a ship and they called it there Kielarnis or keelness they also called the strands furdustrandir or wonder strands because they were so long to sail by then the country became indented with bays and they steered their ships into a bay it was when leif was with king olaf tryggvason and he bade him proclaim christianity to greenland that the king gave him two gales the man's name was haki and the woman's Haikia. the king advised leif to have recourse to these people if he should stand in need of fleetness for they were swifter than deer eric and leif had tendered karlsefni the services of this couple now when they had sailed past wonder strands they put the gales ashore and directed them to run to the southward and investigate the nature of the country and return again before the end of the third half day they were each clad in a garment which they called kiafal which was so fashioned that it had a hood at the top was open at the sides was sleeveless and was fastened between the legs with buttons and loops while elsewhere they were naked karlsefni and his companions cast anchor and lay there during their absence and when they came again one of them carried a bunch of grapes and the other an ear of new-sown wheat they went on board the ship whereupon karlsefni and his followers held on their way until they came to where the coast was indented with bays they stood into a bay with their ships there was an island out at the mouth of the bay about which there were strong currents wherefore they called it straumi or stream isle there were so many birds there that it was scarcely possible to step between the eggs they sailed through the firth and called it straumfjord or stream firth and carried their cargoes ashore from the ships and established themselves there they had brought with them all kinds of livestock it was a fine country there there were mountains thereabouts they occupied themselves exclusively with the exploration of the country they remained there during the winter and they had taken no thought for this during the summer the fishing began to fail and they began to fall short of food then torhall the huntsman disappeared they had already prayed to god for food but it did not come as promptly as their necessities seemed to demand they searched for torhall for three half days and found him on a projecting crag he was lying there and looking up at the sky with mouth and nostrils agape and mumbling something they asked him why he had gone thither he replied that this did not concern any one they asked him then to go home with them and he did so soon after this a whale appeared there and they captured it and flensed it and no one could tell what manner of whale it was and when the cooks had prepared it they ate of it and were all made ill by it then torhall approaching them said did not the red beard prove more helpful than your christ this is my reward for the verses which i composed to thor the trustworthy seldom has he failed me when the people heard this they cast the whale down into the sea and made their appeals to god the weather then improved and they could now row out to fish and thenceforward they had no lack of provisions for they could hunt game on the land gather eggs on the island and catch fish from the sea concerning karlsefni and torhall it is said that torhall wished to sail to the northward beyond wonder strands in search of wineland while karlsefni desired to proceed to the southward off the coast torhall prepared for his voyage out below the island having only nine men in his party for all the remainder of the company went with karlsefni and one day when torhall was carrying water aboard his ship and was drinking he recited this ditty 
when i came these brave men told me here the best of drink i'd get now with water pale behold me wine and i are strangers yet stooping at the spring i've tested all the wine this land affords of its vaunted charms divested poor indeed are its rewards and when they were ready they hoisted sail whereupon torhall recited this ditty comrades let us now be faring homeward to our own again let us try the sea steeds daring give the chafing courser rein those who will may bide in quiet let them praise their chosen land feasting on a whale steak diet in their home by wonder strand note the prose sense of the verse is let us return to our countrymen leaving those who like the country here to cook their whale on wonder strands End note. then they sailed away to the northward past wonder strands and keelness intending to cruise to the westward around the cape they encountered westerly gales were driven ashore in ireland where they were grievously maltreated and thrown into slavery there torhall lost his life according to that which traders have related it is now to be told of karlsefni that he cruised southward off the coast with snorri and bjarni and their people they sailed for a long time and until they came at last to a river which flowed down from the land into a lake and so into the sea there were great bars at the mouth of the river so that it could only be entered at the height of the flood tide karlsefni and his men sailed into the mouth of the river and called it there hop a small landlocked bay they found self-sown wheat fields on the land there wherever there were hollows and wherever there was hilly ground there were vines every brook there was full of fish they dug pits on the shore where the tide rose highest and when the tide fell there were halibut in the pits there were great numbers of wild animals of all kinds in the woods they remained there half a month and enjoyed themselves and kept no watch they had their livestock with them now one morning early when they looked about them they saw a great number of skin canoes and staves were brandished from the boats with a noise like flails and they were revolved in the same direction in which the sun moves then said karlsefni what may this be token snorri torbrand's son answered him it may be that this is a signal of peace wherefore let us take a white shield and display it and thus they did thereupon the strangers rode toward them and went upon the land marveling at those whom they saw before them they were swarthy men and ill-looking and the hair of their heads was ugly they had great eyes and were broad of cheek they tarried there for a time looking curiously at the people they saw before them and then rode away and to the southward around the point karlsefni and his followers had built their huts above the lake some of their dwellings being near the lake and others farther away now they remained there that winter no snow came there and all of their livestock lived by grazing and when spring opened they discovered early one morning a great number of skin canoes rowing from the south past the cape so numerous that it looked as if coals had been scattered broadcast out before the bay and on every boat staves were waved thereupon karlsefni and his people displayed their shields and when they came together they began to barter with each other especially did the strangers wish to buy red cloth for which they offered in exchange peltries and quite gray skins they also desired to buy swords and spears but karlsefni and snorri forbade this in exchange for perfect unsullied skins the skrellings would take red stuff a span in length which they would bind around their heads so their trade went on for a time until karlsefni and his people began to grow short of cloth when they divided it into such narrow pieces that it was not more than a finger's breadth wide but the skrelling still continued to give just as much for this as before or more it so happened that a bull belonging to karlsefni and his people ran out from the woods bellowing loudly this so terrified the skrellings that they sped out to their canoes and then rowed away to the southward along the coast for three entire weeks nothing more was seen of them at the end of this time however a great multitude of skrelling boats was discovered approaching from the south as if a stream were pouring down and all of their staves were waved in a direction contrary to the course of the sun and the skrellings were all uttering loud cries 
thereupon karlsefni and his men took red shields and displayed them the skrellings sprang from their boats and they met then and fought together there was a fierce shower of missiles for the skrellings had war slings karlsefni and snorri observed that the skrellings raised up on a pole a great ball-shaped body almost the size of a ship's belly and nearly black in colour and this they hurled from the pole upon the land above karlsefni's followers and it made a frightful noise where it fell whereat a great fear seized upon karlsefni and all his men so that they could think of naught but flight and of making their escape up along the river bank for it seemed to them that the troop of the skrellings was rushing towards them from every side and they did not pause until they came to certain jutting crags where they offered a stout resistance freydis came out and seeing that karlsefni and his men were fleeing she cried why do you flee from these wretches such worthy men as ye when meseems ye might slaughter them like cattle and i but a weapon methinks i would fight better than any one of you they gave no heed to her words freydis sought to join them but lagged behind for she was not hale she followed them however into the forest while the skrellings pursued her she found a dead man in front of her this was torbrand snorri's son his skull cleft by a flat stone his naked sword lay beside him she took it up and prepared to defend herself with it the skrellings then approached her whereupon she stripped down to her shift and slapped her breast with the naked sword at this the skrellings were terrified and ran down to their boats and rowed away karlsefni and his companions however joined her and praised her valor two of karlsefni's men had fallen and a great number of the skrellings karlsefni's party had been overpowered by dint of superior numbers they now returned to their dwellings and bound up their wounds and weighed carefully what throng of men that could have been which had seemed to descend upon them from the land it now seemed to them that there could have been but the one party that which came from the boats and that the other troop must have been an ocular delusion the skrellings however found the dead man and an axe lay beside him one of their number picked up the axe and struck at a tree with it and one after another they tested it and it seemed to them to be a treasure and to cut well then one of their number seized it and hewed at a stone with it so that the axe broke whereat they concluded that it could be of no use since it would not withstand stone and they cast it away it now seemed clear to karlsefni and his people that although the country thereabouts was attractive their life would be one of constant dread and turmoil by reason of the hostility of the inhabitants of the country so they forthwith prepared to leave and determined to return to their own country they sailed to the northward off the coast and found five skrellings clad in skin doublets lying asleep near the sun there were vessels beside them containing animal marrow mixed with blood karlsefni and his company concluded that they must have been banished from their own land they put them to death they afterwards found a cape upon which there was a great number of animals and this cape looked as if it were one cake of dung by reason of the animals which lay there at night they now arrived again at streamfirth where they found great abundance of all those things of which they stood in need some men say that bjarni and freydis remained behind here with a hundred men and went no further while karlsefni and snorri proceeded to the southward with forty men tarrying at hop barely two months and returning again the same summer karlsefni then set out with one ship in search of torhall the huntsman but the greater part of the company remained behind they sailed to the northward around keelness and then bore to the westward having land to the larboard the country there was a wooded wilderness as far as they could see with scarcely an open space and when they had journeyed a considerable distance a river flowed down from the east toward the west they sailed into the mouth of the river and lay too by the southern bank the slaying of torvald eric's son it happened one morning that karlsefni and his companions discovered in an open space in the woods above them a speck which seemed to shine toward them and they shouted at it it stirred and it was a uniped who skipped down to the bank of the river by which they were lying torvald a son of eric the red was sitting at the helm 
and the uniped shot an arrow into his inwards torvald drew out the arrow and exclaimed there is fat around my paunch we have hit upon a fruitful country and yet we are not like to get much profit of it torvald died soon after from this wound then the uniped ran away back toward the north karlsefni and his men pursued him and saw him from time to time the last they saw of him he ran down into a creek then they turned back whereupon one of the men recited this ditty eager our men uphill down dell hunted a uniped hearken karlsefni while they tell how swift the quarry fled then they sailed away back toward the north and believed they had got sight of the land of the unipeds nor were they disposed to risk the lives of their men any longer they concluded that the mountains of hop and those which they had now found formed one chain and this appeared to be so because they were about an equal distance removed from streamfirth in either direction they sailed back and passed the third winter at streamfirth then the men began to divide into factions of which the women were the cause and those who were without wives endeavoured to seize upon the wives of those who were married whence the greatest trouble arose snorri karlsefni's son was born the first autumn and he was three winters old when they took their departure when they sailed away from wineland they had a southerly wind and so came upon markland where they found five skrellings of whom one was bearded two were women and two were children karlsefni and his people took the boys but the others escaped and these skrellings sank down into the earth they bore the lads away with them and taught them to speak and they were baptized they said that their mother's name was vitildi and their father's uvaigi they said that kings governed the skrellings one of whom was called avaldamun and the other valdidida they stated that there were no houses there and that the people lived in caves or holes they said that there was a land on the other side over against their country which was inhabited by people who wore white garments and yelled loudly and carried poles before them to which rags were attached and people believed that this must have been vitra Manaland, white men's land or ireland the great now they arrived in greenland and remained during the winter with eric the red bjarni grimolf's son and his companions were driven out into the atlantic and came into a sea which was filled with worms and their ship began to sink beneath them note this reference is to the toredo or ship worm that bores into wood and is often a source of danger to unsheathed vessels End note. they had a boat which had been coated with seal tar this the sea worm does not penetrate they took their places in this boat and then discovered that it would not hold them all then said bjarni since the boat will not hold more than half of our men it is my advice that the men who are to go in the boat be chosen by lot for this selection must not be made according to rank this seemed to them all such a manly offer that no one opposed it so they adopted this plan the men casting lots and it fell to bjarni to go in the boat and half of the men with him for it would not hold more but when the men were come into the boat an icelander who was in the ship and who had accompanied bjarni from iceland said dost thou intend bjarni to forsake me here it must be even so answers bjarni not such was the promise thou gavest my father he answers when i left iceland with thee that thou wouldst thus part with me when thou saidst that we should both share the same fate so be it it shall not rest thus answered bjarni do thou come hither and i will go to the ship for i see that thou art eager for life bjarni thereupon boarded the ship and this man entered the boat and they went their way until they came to dublin in ireland and there they told this tale now it is the belief of most people that bjarni and his companions perished in the maggot sea for they were never heard of afterward karlsefni and his wife Turid's issue the following summer karlsefni sailed to iceland and gudrid with him and he went home to Rhineness. his mother believed that he had made a poor match and she was not at home the first winter however when she became convinced that gudrid was a very superior woman she returned to her home and they lived happily together halfrid was a daughter of snorri karlsefni's son she was the mother of bishop torlak runolf's son 
they had a son named torbjorn whose daughter's name was torun she was bishop bjorn's mother torger was the name of a son of snorri karlsefni's son he was the father of ingveld mother of bishop brand the elder steinun was a daughter of snorri karlsefni's son who married einar a son of grundar ketil a son of torvald crook a son of tori of espihol their son was torstein the unjust he was the father of gudrun who married jorund of keldur their daughter was halla the mother of flosi the father of valgerd the mother of hera erlin the stout the father of hera hauk the lawman another daughter of flosi was tordis the mother of fru ingigerd the mighty her daughter was fru halbera abbess of Rhineness at stadt many other great people in iceland are descended from karlsefni and turid who are not mentioned here god be with us amen end of part three recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the saga of eric the red translated